Firstly, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here and give, you, uh, give a few words about Holberton, explain who we are and why we are doing this today. Uh, so Holberton is a college alternative. We are training people to become software engineers uh, and we want to make this high quality education uh, to the many. So it's a school where there are no teacher, no lecture. Students learn by working on project in groups. Um, so basically it's project-based and peer-based learning. Uh, where students learn the hard skills to become software engineers, uh, but also the soft skills uh, to be amazing professionals. Um, the school has been changing quite a lot. Uh, historically, we've been a uh, San Francisco school, and actually since uh, this year, we've grown our impact to a broader audience, and uh, we've opened five campuses within the span of a year. Uh, which is uh, fulfilling the mission of providing high quality education for the many. We want to bring this to more communities. Um, as a school, we always um, push to provide an education that will get students an amazing jobs. And uh, within the scope of the fourth industrial revolution, this means developing cutting edge technology curriculum. So in last June, uh, we announced our ARVR curriculum that we built in, in collaboration with Unity and Ubisoft. And today we are very proud to announce our new machine learning curriculum um, that we built to uh, get more talent into the industry. It's highly needed, but one thing that's very important is that the industry doesn't just need software engineer. The industry needs them to, be, uh, to have ethics, uh, to have diversity of thoughts, of background, um, so that we are not building broken machine learning algorithm, and the panel is going to discuss this. Without further ado, I will leave the stage to Kim and the panelists. Thank you, enjoy your night. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good evening. <laughs> Happy holidays. Thank you for holidays. Happy holidays. I'm ready for the holidays. You guys ready for the holidays? I really am. But I'm still working. Still working very hard and very excited to be here with you all this evening. Um, my name is Kimberly Bryant. I am the founder and CEO of a nonprofit organization that's also based here in the Bay Area called Black Girls Code. We teach girls from underrepresented communities about computer science and technology, and we really try to prepare them to be the next generation of innovators in the technology space. Um, we started back in 2011. We started very grassroots out in Bayview Hunters Point, a little bit away from here. Our offices are now in Oakland. That's our headquarters. But we also have an office in New York, which is in the Google building. I literally just got back from there like 12.30 last night, so it was still a jet lag. But um, we're there, half the team is there, half the team is here, but we have chapters all across the US and one in Johannesburg. Um, we found ourselves being introduced to the team at Holberton um, about this time last year, I think it was, and we really fell in love with the team uh, and their passion for technology. And the team is just full of good people and we have started to try to build a relationship with them. They've opened their spaces to us and I really have enjoyed working with them uh, uh, tremendously, which is why um, Sylvan asked me to do this, moderate this panel like a couple of weeks ago when we were here doing another event. I was like, yes, just let me know. <laughs> like, I probably won't have time to get anything together, but I'll be there. <laughs> it was kind of like that. So it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And I want to just jump right in in this really great conversation around machine learning and ethics uh, with the star studded panel that I have here on stage with me. And I'm going to pass the mic to Gabriella to introduce herself, and then we'll go to Paige. And of course, we will pull in none other than the superstar himself, Neo, to join us. <laughs> um, but I'll pass it. <laughs> Get started with Gabriella. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and what, what makes you passionate about machine learning. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sivan, for the invitation. I'm so excited for tonight because we are going to talk about very important aspects of AI and machine learning. So, but let me introduce myself. So my name is Gabriela de Queiroz. I'm originally from Brazil, but I've been in San Francisco for, woo! <laughs> 
I've been in San Francisco for the past seven years, so I moved from Brazil to here. So what I do, so I work as a machine learning manager. I have a team of 10 open source developers, and all we do is free open source, and the goal is to create tools so people can use deep learning without prior knowledge. That's my daytime work. My side project, which is not as much side project anymore, is an organization that I found in 2012 after I'm moving from Brazil to San Francisco that, that is called R Ladies. So R is a programming language pretty much like Python. I think the majority here knows what Python is, but it's a programming language for like data science, for example. So I created R Ladies as a way for me to give back to the community. So um, the, 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 the organization now has grown so much that we are in 180 cities in 49 countries with more than 60,000 members. <laughs> uh, so that's what I'm passionate about. It's all the community involvement that I have and my work as uh, open source developer and manager. But uh, with the whole thing around AI and, and discrimination and bias and ethics, all the, the, the risks um, and the whole conversation around facial recognition that is going on right now, I felt the need to do something. I said, I cannot be here like doing my work and not do anything else. So I created a new project called AI Inclusive, which you all should check. It's ai-inclusive.org. And the idea is to bring more diversity into the artificial intelligence field. So we know, and we are going to discuss tonight about the whole diversity issue that we have in AI, the whole uh, thing about bias. Uh, we just had the launch last week in San Francisco, this week in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So that's pretty much what I've been doing. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Give it up for Gabriela to pass it to Paige. Excellent. So, so thank you to everyone for having us here today to talk about this issue. Um, it's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm Paige Bailey. I'm a product manager for TensorFlow at Google. Um, in case you haven't heard about it before, TensorFlow is the deep learning framework that's embedded into every single Google product. So if you've ever spoken into your cell phone and seen speech translated to text, that's TensorFlow. Um, if you are playing with the really cool style transfer demo outside, um, that is an example of what can be powered with TensorFlow. Um, if you've ever uh, sort of seen search do auto-completion um, on Google.com, congratulations, that's TensorFlow. Um, so uh, that, is, that is what I get to spend my daytime work on today. And what I really love about it is that it's open source. So anybody can download it, anybody can use it. Um, we've had something uh, to the effect of like 4.7 million downloads since we open sourced it in 2015. And it's now on more than 2 billion devices globally. Um, so it, it's been really exciting to see that grow. Um, before I came to Google, I worked at Microsoft in the office of the Azure CTO. So doing work with machine learning there um, and also uh, worked as a machine learning engineer for a little bit over a decade at NASA and, and the energy industry, particularly in helping find more sustainable ways to, um, to use energy and to extract it. Uh, so it, it's been really kind of a, an interesting ride. I'm particularly excited to talk about AI inclusive um, and some of the tooling that we've built at Google as part of people in AI research to help you understand your model's internals and to also inspect them and to understand any bias that might be in your models. So very, uh, let's get started, I guess, after Neo. And, well, <laughs> like, uh, hey, what's going on, everybody? Um, my name is Neo. I am a singer, songwriter, uh, dancer, actor, and uh, now tech enthusiast. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I am here in representation of uh, diversity for for tech in general, but especially uh, doing so for Hoverton. Uh, I was introduced to Hoverton through uh, Trinity Ventures, uh, good friends uh, Angela Acharya and uh, Anita Chatterjee uh, introduced me to 
these two really cool French guys with really cool French accents. And, um, <laughs> they're really cool French accents. And uh, uh, to Holberton and just what Holberton is, and uh, I was all for it, you know. Um, uh, I don't have to tell anybody in this room, but I'm gonna do it anyway, that technology is changing the face of the planet by the second, and uh, it's changing it for everybody. Everybody, including people that look like me. So, um, they brought me in to try to help uh, just just uh, bring a bit more diversity to what Holberton is, and I feel like it's been working since I got here. Uh, Holberton's in, uh, African American enrollment went from 5% to 11%. Um, yes, please clap for me for that, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we, it's still very much uphill battle. You know, we, we need more uh, more people of color. We need more women, uh, just period, point blank, in, in the tech space, period. So that is why I'm here. Uh, before this, uh, my tech knowledge was Pro Tools and an ungodly amount of video games. <laughs> Not so much how they're created, but just playing them, period. Yeah. Just, and uh, But yeah, uh, that's why I'm here. And uh, all right, let's get the conversation started. Yeah, here we go. All right. So I wanted to quickly jump into just a definition for Paige and Gabriella, the experts here on the stage. Um, could you tell us a little bit about or define what is machine learning? And since we've also used the term AI, artificial intelligence, what is the difference? I'm just gonna you know, add that to the mix. So explain to us what is machine learning and what is AI, what are the differences? And, and what can you achieve? What can everyone in this room achieve through those tools? Right, like, so other than just a buzzword, um, <laughs> AI is uh, just a fancy term for being able to use data and what you expect to extract from data um, to define rules and logic. So what do I mean by that? Um, historically, if you were a software engineer, you as the engineer would be responsible for taking input data and for creating a lot of if-else rules and for loops and all these conditional things to get some sort of output. Um, with machine learning, you have your input data and you have what you expect the output to be. So like you get some sort of JPEG image, you expect for there to be a hot dog or a not hot dog or something <laughs> if you're a fan of Silicon Valley. And then the computer goes through and through an algorithm um, defines out what would constitute a hot dog or a not hot dog. Um, so instead of you having to hard code all of that logic, um, it's done for you. And if you're lazy like me, that is awesome, right? Like it, it gives you the ability to, to kind of have all of those things um, just out of the box ready for you to use. Um, but that also means that you have a lot less control over the kind of programs that you create. Uh, and machine learning is uh, a family of algorithms that is a subset of AI. And AI is really just any program that allows a, a computer to mimic uh, human behavior. So you could also imagine creating an AI program uh, that you, know, you just say hello and it, you can hard code a response back but machine learning is specifically um, the ability to take data, to take your expected output, and then to generate back those rules and logic. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah. Sounds good to me. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I don't have anything to add. I think that was a l beautiful lecture. <laughs> but one thing that I want to add is like everything like here in your home, in your cell phone, it's all based in AI. Your email, your Google Assistant, Siri, like everything there is AI going on on the, on the background. So it's everywhere. Since you all blew through that question, I have a follow-up. <laughs> so I often say my Gmail knows me better than most people in my family because it auto-completes things in the way just the way I would say that. That's TensorFlow <laughs> too. How, <laughs> excellent. How, how can you explain a little bit about as we close this piece out, like it, how do you train the computers to, to think that way with this millions of folks like me who are using and typing an email each and every day? Right, so, so some models are based on aggregate data of, of a large number of users and some models are fine-tuned 
based on your specific uh, your specific data, right? And so all of it is is kind of kept locally for you. So an example would be on your cell phone, um, if you're using a Pixel device or you're using Android, um, as you type out text messages, um, all of those uh, text messages that you type, all of the data is staying on your device, but it's being used to fine tune your preferences. So the model is being built on the data that you've, uh, that you've kind of used over time, um, that, you've, that you've input into the model over time. Um, and that's how it learns, uh, that's how it learns precisely what you would say. So, so whenever I type in, you know, I want a pizza with mushrooms and with sausage, um, that's because it, it knows that that's my, my favorite kind of pizza um, sort of thing. But machine learning models, it's also important to note that they can only learn from the input data that's been used to train them. So if there has been a scenario um, that is completely un, un, uh, sort of unprecedented, right? A machine learning model could never be so creative as to think of that, right? Like as humans, we can think of things and do things that nobody has ever thought of before. Um, machine learning models are kind of forced to only keep doing what they've seen historically. Yeah, they, they, they only know what you provide, right? That's, that's fascinating. And I, I think it really also cues us up into this next question is, this panel is really to talk about ethics as it relates and intersects with machine learning, technology, artificial intelligence. So I wanted to kind of dive into and just go down the row about what are the issues that we will face potentially as we move into more of a utilization re uh, reliance on machine learning and artificial intelligence, and what are the risks if those algorithms are not created by diverse teams? And I want to start with Gabriella with her work with AI Inclusive, but also pull in um, both Neo and, and Paige to this part of the discussion as well. Yeah, so that's, that's something that we have been discussing in the society right now, especially here in the Bay Area. Uh, but it's like there are so many implications, right? So if you think about like the facial recognition and like how you are training your data. So it all always starts with your data set, like you, whatever you are giving to your model. So if your data set's not diverse, the algorithm, it's only going to recognize or to do the things that you provide them, right? So like if your data is biased from the beginning, your algorithm is going to be biased in the end. So that's why it's so important to have not only like, how do you build a diverse data set, for example? It's like you have to have a, a diverse team of people working on that. So um, that's, that's something that it's, it's going to uh, be worse and worse if we don't do anything. And the population that is going to suffer the most is going to be the underrepresented or subrepresented population. So in particular, women, gender minorities, people of color, for example. And people from other countries, too. So like, a, a, this is a great example. Um, so if you think of a wedding in the United States, right, like you're probably thinking of like white dresses, a very, uh, you know, like people, people looking a certain way, wearing a certain kind of clothing. Weddings look very different in India, in China, and other locations around the world. Um, and so if you, if you start looking for pictures of weddings um, on search engines or if you, if you are you know, putting in a photo into your machine learning algorithm um, and it's a wedding in China, that might not necessarily be, uh, that might not necessarily be caught um, if your data set was not trained with representative uh, examples of photos of weddings in China. So basically, if there's just one type of person creating this data and uh, basically teaching this machine, then all that machine is going to know is what that one type of person taught it. Exactly. Right. So yep. I love pizza. So if all I if I teach the machine, pizza is the greatest food on the face of the planet, huh. and then you ask the pizza, you ask the machine what an apple is, it's going to show you a pizza. <laughs> right. That's that's basically what. Or or if you if you say like show me a picture of the greatest food in the world, it'll and show you. And it's going to show you pizza. Yeah, it will. Mm -hmm. Got that. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I like to break things down in layman terms because I'm 
kind of stupid, just a little, just a little bit. Um, okay, so that, so that is why diversity and ethics need to be at the forefront of this conversation, uh, be, it, be you a diverse person or a typical whatever the case may be. Um, you cannot expect the machine, she just said that the machine is not capable of learning on its own. It only knows what you teach it. So um, it's kind of like creating the wheel and going, oh, Eureka, we created the wheel. And then you roll it down the hill and it keeps going and you didn't consider brakes, damn it. How are you gonna stop it? So I, I, think, I think the, the what if is just as important as the Eureka. And that's why, uh, that's, well, that's why I'm sitting up here anyway, just to make sure that that is understood by people who don't so much understand computers as well as you guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And asking the questions, like I think it's, I think it's very, very important to note that even if you don't have a technology background or don't have a machine learning background, everyone can still ask questions about ethics. Like, is this decision being made? Is it, is it useful? Is it correct? Like, what kind of data was used to make this decision? Is this fair? Um, all of those questions are incredibly viable, and they're much needed in data science teams. Um, so if you ever see an algorithm that you think is behaving strangely, like that is a bug. That is a bug and you should file it um, and, and make sure that the team is aware that potentially their algorithm is not operating the way that it should be. I wanted to ask you all about an incident that occurred recently. There's this new fantastic thing called the Apple Card, which I am really trying not to apply for, but that's just me. You all may have one. But <laughs> if you're on social media a lot like I am, you may have seen this, this, this long social media thread that happened a couple of months ago or so, where um, there's a tech CEO, he applied for the Apple Card, his wife applied for the Apple Card as well, he got a very large limit, credit limit. She got a tiny one with the same data. Now, in listening to Paige, that seems like there was something algorithmically wrong there. Can it, it, but is, is that right or is it wrong? Can you explain to us a little bit about how something like that could have been a bug on the Apple side as far as their algorithm was concerned? Yeah, so so I don't know about the about the Apple um, about the Apple machine learning teams, but I, I do know that uh, an example that's always pointed out um, as a as a particularly bad machine learning ethics violation is um, banks giving out loans. So so there are data sets um, that have uh, you know sort of people's ages, their education levels, where they live, so the zip code that they that they live in, um, what their income is each year, all of these things, and this data had sometimes been used by banks to say like yes we'll give you a loan or no we will not, and they'd been using that data, um, that historic data, as examples of people who had paid back their loans on time or who did not pay back their loans on time. Um, and they built this model, and they were getting back results. And what they didn't know is that things like income levels, education levels, and zip code were all indicators of race, of socioeconomic status, um, of uh, sort of gender, like if you were a stay-at-home mom, um, all of these different things. And so this model was inherently biased. Um, and it was preferentially giving loans to white men with high, uh, with high education status, high job brackets, um, then not giving loans to people from low socioeconomic backgrounds and women. Yeah, one, one thing interesting on that front, uh, yeah. the Apple card, is it's such an old problem. And like, how come they didn't find out about this before, right? It's such a, like, that's the first thing that they would, you know, check. But then the other issue is like, okay, now they found out that there is something about the algorithm that it's not doing what what's supposed to do. Then they go to the Apple card, but then Apple card says, no, it's not my fault. The bank issued the cards, so they are 
responsible. And then the cars say, no, we don't know what's going on. It's a black, bo black box model, so we don't have anything to do about it. So that goes to the next thing is like, who is responsible for this? Who is paying for the issues that we are facing? Mm -hmm. So, so what's, your, what's your answer to that for everyone on the panel? How do we address these barriers when it comes to ethics and how the algorithms are created and, and who creates them? What's, what's the answer for that? So, so I know that many countries are considering legislation. So making it so that algorithms have to have some sort of explainability associated with them if they're deployed into production. Um, at Google, we are working on something called People in AI Research by uh, Fernanda Villegas is leading up that effort in addition to Tim Nikabru, who founded Black and AI um, and who does a lot of really, really excellent research um, that's, uh, that's socioeconomic related and, and just in general. Um, but these tools are all open source. They're built using TensorFlow. If you go to PAIR-code, Dot github dot io, um, you can see a huge collection of them, but they're all about how you can sort of understand your models, inspect them, and get some idea of bias that you might not have been able to see otherwise. Um, yeah, so the only way that I see a solution is if there is any le legislation yes. behind, like someone has to pay for it, the price, right? So like right now there is no legislation, so no one is responsible. Uh, I think that the answer, again, lies in the initial, the initial coding, the initial teaching of the machine, so to speak. Again, if only one, one type of person is teaching the machine, then the machine is gonna, only going to cater to one type of person. So that's where diversity steps in. I feel like if this is, again, something that affects us all, that we all should be included. So uh, just... just making sure that it's inclusive to everyone so that situations like the Apple Card don't happen in the future. You know, now the machine knows to consider everybody because everybody was a part of teaching the machine, so to speak. Yeah. I think one, one last question on this one I, I would love to get your thoughts on is when we talk about ethics, um, I, I think we're interrogating this conversation around ethics now as it relates to technology and AI, but perhaps we're at an interesting point in humanity <laughs> where this conversation around ethics goes a lot deeper. And I, I often wonder about this in, in my work in particular because I work with young people who are growing up in this time which is so much different than what my environment was, what was happening around me at the time. So can you speak a little bit about what you think? Not if and it doesn't even have to be your, your work per se, on this moment in time that we're in now as, as we're going into a new decade and, and how ethics or the lack of ethics, it, it really has, it impacts so much of our life, not just in technology and algorithms, but in the political sphere and how there's income inequality, uh, all of these things, and, and how important it is, is it for us to make sure the next generation um, has a firmer, perhaps if that's what you believe, <laughs> I don't want to put it words in, but how do you think this impacts the next generation that all of us will be engaged with it in this conversation around ethics in particular. So my take on this is we'll have to incorporate this into the education from like the very early ages. They need to be aware, right? So from the very, very, very bottom. Uh, another thing is like, um, I think when you are working with this, especially in tech, you are going to have a variety of people from different backgrounds, very diverse. So you are not going to have only like machine learning engineers, computer scientists, data scientists. You are going to be surrounded by philosophers, psychologists, um, you know, people from the, the, the humanity discussing these issues, right? So they are all going to be together, come together as a team so then we can, that's the other thing that I, that I see. So the two pieces, the education piece that is going to be incorporated, and then the team that is very diverse where they are going to be discussing this. 
And and I think it's also important, like kids are so amazing now. Like, and uh, the things that high school students are doing to found their own companies or to, to sort of do things that change the world, it's really, really exciting to see. And they also, um, it's also really kind of important to, to note that you can have global impact now and be able to impact. Uh, so for TensorFlow, for example, we just recently had these documentation sprints um, that were intended to just be kind of, uh, docs are a great way to contribute to open source. So we gave places $300 to buy food, to get together, to have a party, and to contribute to open source documentation. And uh, kind of uh, not at all expected for me, um, we ended up having these uh, doc sprints in over 100 locations globally. Um, including 48% in Africa. Uh, and so, so all of these people were getting together and having this feeling of community. Um, and I was so shocked as people were tweeting, you know, pictures of these experiences. And I didn't see laptops in every location. I saw people on cell phones. I didn't see people on laptops. And it's partially because they were making pull requests on GitHub from their cell phones to make modifications in the documentation. Like people were, uh, like there was one uh, example in Buea where 12 women were working together on a documentation sprint. The power went out halfway through. Um, it came back on at 11 p.m. and they picked right back up and started submitting PRs again. Like, and so, so just sort of understanding um, that people are coming from different sorts of backgrounds that you know, people have different resources, um, and to be able to make sure that that all of your products and the software you create and the models that you create work for all of them and, and for those unique contexts. So just being empathetic, I think, is, is going to be huge, and teaching that to kids and making sure that that everybody operates in a similar way. I think the conversation. Uh about children is very, very important because uh, to coin the phrase, they are absolutely the future. So I'm in the music industry, right? <clears throat> I can recall a time where, uh, as an American artist, you put out an album in America, right? And you would move around touring for that album in America, and then it would take a good amount of months before people in Europe got the album, before people in China got the album, whatever the case may be. That is no longer the case. Now everybody kind of gets everything at the same time. So the, the internet and technology has, in a sense, made the world smaller. Like, there is no excuse for the ignorance anymore. Like, to, for, for, for anybody to not include other cultures or people from other cultures in anything and everything just absolutely makes no sense. Like, that's, it's purposely done at this point. You know, there's, there's no excuse for, for the ignorance anymore. We all know that we are not alone. We all know that the way that we do things is not the only way that things are done. And I feel like in that AI is the future, uh, I, I'm just gonna say it again, in that AI is the future, everyone needs to be included in, in, in contributing to what this AI is. It, it, if machine learning is the future, then everybody needs to be included in teaching these machines whatever it is that they're gonna know so that the machines know to include everybody. So that there are no there are no algorithm algorithms that are biased. So that there is no uh, cyber racism anymore. So that none of those things exist. Uh, again, it it only knows what we teach it at the end of the day. So I feel like it's it's not so much a technology problem as it is a human problem, and us just realizing that we're all here. None of us are going anywhere. So we might as well get along and include everybody in everything. Uh, uh, again. Uh, that is Neo speaking in layman's terms because I don't speak computer. <laughs> awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome. So I want to pull the audience in here for some questions now, but before I do, I wanted to give each of you a chance, each of you a chance, <laughs> to give any final thoughts about your thoughts about machine learning and ethics, what you would like to leave with the audience. Um, any challenges to the audience around ethics and AI and machine learning? Just your final thoughts and, and really the top of mind for you in, on this topic right now. So for me, it's like, come join AI Inclusive. Let's make this community more inclusive and AI more inclusive in general. That's my takeaway. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> awesome. So my takeaway would be if you're building machine learning models or if you're interested in building machine learning models, go to pair-code.github.io um, and make sure that you put those models through the unbiasing tools if it's dealing with any kind of human data whatsoever um, to understand how it's making its decisions and to, uh, to sort of make sure that it's not biasing against certain groups. Uh, my takeaway is uh, to join Hoverton, damn it. Yeah, and we're all. <laughs> Absolutely, where we re reinvent the wheel and consider the brakes at the same time. All right, I think there's a mic somewhere in the audience. Um, are there any questions? Do you have any questions out there? The founding fathers put together the Constitution and they did it in such a way to benefit themselves and people that looked like them for centuries to come. And I wonder if it's sort of naive of us to believe that the people that have the power right now are not incentivized to do the exact same thing, right? Like, organize it in such a way that you know 300 years from now it benefits you and people that look like you and how do we think about that because i think it's, it's nice to have these conversations but i'm just not sure that an incentive for the people that have the power actually exists who wants to take them gabriel <laughs> you don't know Paige. i mean i, I believe <laughs> <laughs> I think the purpose of these conversations, the purpose of this specific conversation is to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, we are in this room aware of the fact that the future is coming and that AI and machine learning is a part of that future. So I think to prevent that from happening, more conversations like these need to happen. Uh, the people in this room need to take this conversation out into the world, into your collective groups and whatever the case may be, so that that doesn't happen again. I, I, I believe that that's why we're meeting like this in the first place, is so to ensure that that does not happen. Absolutely, and, and to make sure also to let your politicians know that you would be supportive of legislation that would detect bias in machine learning algorithms. So Europe is, I, I think, championing this right now. Um, one, of their recent, uh, one of their recent politicians stood up and said, you know, we want to have ethical AI within the next 90 days, and at the end of this, we're going to have legislation in place so that no companies can have um, algorithms in production that bias against certain groups. Um, I would love to see more things like that in the United States. And I, I hope that we do have uh, legislation to that effect soon. Yeah, I also think that's so hard to come from the top, right? So we have to have this discussion, and then luckily they'll be aware. But it's normally it doesn't come from the top, it comes from you know, us here getting together and having this conversation and then fighting for it. Uh, one thing I would add is that one, that gives me hope is that I know a, a couple of months ago there was a congressional hearing on AI um, that AOC, a, a couple of hearings that she facilitated. Yeah, and I, I'm really encouraged by this, this new generation of legislat legislators because they are users, they are digital native, they are, they are aware of technology and technolo technological impact in a way that some of our, our more mature and senior senators and legislators are not. And so for me, I think of this work in terms of really getting the next generation ready, sort of like what Neo was saying, so that they have the knowledge where they're ready to move in those different areas of leadership, and also really leveraging those folks like AOC that are in position now to push some of this legislation forward and are reaching back into the community of those folks that are, are working in the field and are the experts. Like I knew a couple of folks, more than a couple of folks that testified during those hearings from the technolo technology world, and they were tapped by AOC and, and to come in and speak to that. So I, 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 I think that's to say I'm hopeful, but I agree with you that you know we're, we're talking about systemic change, and systemic change is very difficult. Like, so we have to understand that. But I think it's imperative that, that we understand the tools, and then we know how, how power works, and we utilize these tools uh, to move the, the power structure in a way that will create more equity for everyone. And we got to keep pushing on that. 
Anyone else? Oh, Sabah, you got a question? Are, you, okay, are we, we over time? One more. Okay, one more question. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I do actually work for Holbrain. Uh, but my question is, <laughs> yeah, but I do have a real question. Uh, this is not a plan, I promise. Uh, but so I work with students who come in with little to no experience. And so these students sometimes feel like they can't, they have nothing to contribute, which I totally disagree with. But how can we, as with limited or no experience in the tech field, make contributions to this because it's so important to all of us? So exactly what, what Paige was saying, right? So do you want to talk about the documentation, for example? Yes, so, so uh, documentation sprints are a great way to get involved, but also everyone, no matter what your background, you can ask questions about algorithms. Um, if you, uh, just as you can question the ethics of any other person in this world, right? Um, so sort of helping your students understand that even if they are coming from a limited technology background, um, they can learn that much quicker than they can learn um, sort of how to be an ethical human, I suppose, right? So, so if, if, and they're coming at it from their unique perspectives like Gabriella was mentioning. We need philosophers. We need environmental scientists. We need musicians. We need everyone. Um, to, to, sort of, uh, to sort of bring their skills to the table and to use technology to augment those talents. We need you. You yes. said you work for Holbergen, like, right? Awesome. We need you, damn it. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. And educators like yourselves. Um, but, uh, and thank you so much for the great work that you're doing and, and sort of helping these students on their journey to becoming machine learning engineers or becoming AR. Um, AR engineers. Yeah, and, and let me add you something from my personal experience because I like to come and relate to my experience. So I'm from Brazil, again, like we were talking about computer, like how do you teach them to program if they don't have computers? It's a, it's a basic problem. The problem is even further. It's not like, so it's not having opportunities, right? So I got my first computer, I was 24, 25. I learned to program, I was 30. <laughs> so like we all can, right? What it's missing is the opportunity. So Hubbardton is giving the opportunity, right? So that's the key thing. Give the opportunity to the people and they will make it. All right. Thanks a lot. A big round of applause for our panelists. Tim Bernie, Gabriela, Paige and Neil. And Kristen over there is amazing, I can tell you. <laughs> She's our uh, engineer and resident here at Holberton, and she's uh, making sure that our students are reaching their goal of becoming great software engineers. Um, I really love the end of the panel. I think it's about hope. It's about believing that we can make a change in this world. Obviously, as the panel said, it's not just a few of us that will make a difference. It's all of us. So we count on you in the audience to um, you know, ask questions, educate others, um, always like you know, share, like. Um, with other like who may not be in the tech industry because tech is not only for tech companies now it's everywhere in our life and so is becoming machine learning. Um, thanks again for coming with us tonight. Uh, we are going to be serving more food and drinks so enjoy and see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>